Well, good evening and welcome to the Coalition for Conservation's webinar on the UK leadership on climate. I'm Christina Talako, the chair of C4C, and I'd like to start by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. For those who don't know C4C, we are a not-for-profit. We engage with politicians to support sensible and economically viable policy on climate and conservation. We work as a bridge between government, business and industry. And we've been working very closely to the UK Conservatives lately through SEN, which is the Conservative Environment Network. This year, we hosted uh, webinars with David Cameron, with the chairman of the UK Climate Change Committee, Lord Dibbon, and tonight, it's a great privilege to have with us the former UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, joined by New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian. But in terms of format, the first half of the webinar will be just a conversation with these two outstanding leaders and will be fo followed by a Q&A se session. So if you wish to ask a question, please type that question in the Q&A box. Now the webinar will be recorded. The video will be circulated to those who registered. In order to make this the most of our time tonight, I will skip all the formal introductions and kick off by asking Teresa a first question. Teresa, good morning, and we're delighted to have you. Good Thank morning. you so much for joining us and for your support. Teresa, the UK was uh, very much hit by COVID with Britain's economy contracting by 20.4%. And naturally the focus of the government there, much like here, has been to protect lives and jobs and the economy. So do you feel that COVID has taken some of that attention away from the threat of climate change? Well, I, I said good morning. I think I should say good evening to you, uh, Christina, and uh, to all those, uh, all those taking part in this webinar. Um, naturally, and I think this has happened in most countries, over the past few months, the focus of governments and of people has been on the question of COVID and how to deal with COVID. And so there's been less attention given to the climate change issue. And of course, here in the UK, we were due to host COP26 later this year. And that has now, of course, been postponed until 2021 uh, to give us time to be able to develop that and ensure we can have that as the major uh, e event in the climate change, in dealing with climate change, that it should be. But climate change remains then in the background as one of those issues. And I think there's a, an opportunity now, and indeed Boris Johnson here in the UK has talked about building back greener. And so as we look to restore our economies, as we look to the future, this is an opportunity, I think, to say what is the economy of the future in the 21st century, not just trying to replicate what we've always had in the past and climate change building back greener, dealing with the environmental issues, I think will be a major part of that. Right, and in fact, the UK has put forward a number of green initiatives in their post-COVID recovery stimulus. So, but do you feel those initiatives, from what you know, are ambitious enough to reach uh, the net zero that you proposed last year and, and drive the economic growth that, we need to be, that needs to be driven now? Well, if we're going to reach the net zero, and of course, I was pleased to note that the UK was the first major economy to put that net zero by 2050 uh, target into our legislation. To meet that, we're going to have to do a number of things over the coming years. So it's not just one initiative, two initiatives. There's going to be a whole raft of, of things that will be necessary to, uh, to do. But it's good that we are seeing some uh, of the initiatives, for example, a, a, an initiative on more energy efficient homes, government providing uh, grants to people to uh, try and make sure their homes are more energy efficient. Things like that will play their part, but there isn't one single thing that is going to do what we need to do to reach that zero target. But I, I, what you said about economic growth matter here, Christina, because so often in the past, the climate change debate has been about either you can have economic growth or you can deal with climate change. That's not the case. You can have both. And I think up to us as centre-right politicians to find that way forward of ensuring that we have growth and, uh, and deal with climate change. The UK, um, since 1990, the economy has grown 75%. We've cut emissions 43%. We're the, the fastest, the, in terms of G20 countries, we've cut emissions faster than any other. Very true. Thanks for that, Teresa. 
I'll just introduce Gladys now. Welcome, Gladys, and thank, thank you for you. being here. Um, you know, when we sent those invitations for tonight's event, we received so many messages from our New South Wales supporters. They were all asking me to thank you and convey to you how grateful they were, uh, they are for your hard work and dedication and how you dealt with bushfires and now COVID. So on behalf of the guests, we thank you for everything you've done for the New South Wales um, people. So Gladys, we, we saw that the GDP result, as, as we expected, wasn't great. You know, it's showing that Australia has suffered its deepest economic crisis since the 1930s. And New South Wales definitely took the biggest hit through the quarter. Uh, will, you, will this economic crisis affect, you know, New South Wales very progressive agenda that you have on climate? Or do you see this also as an opportunity to invest even more on renewables and sustainable practices? Well, I think Teresa's contribution was um, music to my ears to demonstrate how a modern demo progressive democracy with a centre-right government is able to be world leading in its um, emissions policy, but also seeing it as, an, as a potential for economic growth. And that's exactly how we feel here in New South Wales. In fact, my only hesitation in joining this evening's webinar was to, to be cast alongside Theresa May, who's got an outstanding record in so many areas of public policy, but um, certainly the way in which she led her government and um, her community to adopt these plans, I think, is legacy making. And for us, uh, I think that's why um, those of us who feel progressive about climate change and sustainable um, energy sources, it, it's not exclusive, it's mutually inclusive to economic growth. And, uh, and ironically, I'm perhaps call me idealistic, but when the pandemic is here and it first started, we were all in survival mode, making sure we survived. But I think it's also humanised us. And I think as we emerge from COVID, that the public will feel more connected and more in tune with protecting the environment and more sustainable. And I actually think the population um, for more than at any time in our history here in Australia will feel much more amenable to jobs of the future, sustainable living, uh, but also respect for the environment. And I actually feel this is an opportune time for all those things to come together, including economic jobs piece, because um, many traditional occupations have gone through enormous transformation, some thrust upon them, some freely during this time. And But I do feel that um, we've all been brought down to earth a little bit in terms of our humanity and our place on the planet. And, I, and I'm hoping that will encourage um, greater uh, community earns for, for, for getting that balance, to, to be able to have a sustainable emissions target, but also a growth strategy for jobs is the perfect combination. And Theresa's already done it. I mean, they've already set the path up in the UK. So we've got a model we can follow. And I doubt many Australians would be objecting to follow the path of the UK um, conservative government in relation to climate. So we've, we've got the model the model potential there. But in New South Wales, we've recently set up our, um, our um, renewable energy zones. And Minister Keane might be joining us on the webinar later, but the Environment Minister here in New South Wales has done a great job working with regional communities in setting up um, our, our regional uh, zones, which focus on renewable energy jobs. And, um, and I think what we need to do better, perhaps in New South Wales and Australia to improve the narrative is target those jobs in communities who might be transitioning out of other jobs, whether it's traditional fossil fuel or others, because that's the concern. But if you can hypothecate those jobs into communities, because their main concern is not what they're digging out of the ground, but the fact that they're putting food on the table. And if you can allay those concerns, I think, and, and overlay the jobs growth in those communities who are feeling the angst, uh, I think that's a mutual, mutually beneficial way forward. Mm. Yeah, so Teresa, as we heard from Gladys, um, in, in Australia, the states like New South Wales have made quite a bit of progress and a lot of them setting their targets for 2050. Uh, but at federal level, of course, it's been a bit harder to reach bipartisanship and many conservative politicians here are of the opinion that we should not impose targets and we haven't been able to agree on an integrated energy policy and also we don't agree on a tax or, or you know on a carbon tax and one argument for that obviously as liberals that we believe that we should leave it for the markets to decide on how to get there without much government interference but 
in your experience and, and what's your view on that approach? Because, you know, how important was it for the UK to have those targets um, and legislate targets on, on climate? Well, I think it is important and it's, and what you said, Christina, about conservative politicians and the normal sort of conservative or central <laughs> approach to these things and to targets is absolutely right, because naturally we tend not to want to see targets. We tend to, to want to see the individual responsibility, markets taking the strain and, and developing uh, what, uh, what is necessary. But actually what the target does is it does focus people's minds. And I think this is what is so important. It, it also says this matters. This is an issue that, is, that really matters to all of us. And it gives us an opportunity behind that target to bring people together to work to develop the, the responses that are necessary. And I was interested in what Gladys had just said about the question about uh, in some of those communities where naturally in moving towards dealing with climate change, perhaps jobs that are currently there will, will no longer be there in, in, the, in the future, but transitioning those to the new jobs, uh, the renewable energy jobs is important. And you can look in the UK at somewhere like up in uh, Grimsby, for example, where there's a state-of-the-art work being done on wind farm technology, providing not just jobs for people in the local community, but actually well-paid jobs, skilled jobs for people in the local community. And getting that transition right is, uh, is very important. But if you don't have the target, then um, the danger is that people's focus goes away from the issue. And I think that's what the target does. It gives us that focus, which says, yes, we've all got to work together now to actually reach that. And it, 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 um, it drives that change. Mm. You agree with that then, Gladys? Oh, absolutely. And um, I think that is the key to our success because um, uh, often detractors from moving forward in this area in, in our nation, in our state, um, you know, highlight highlight the jobs issue um, but I feel if there's a solution around that as, as Therese and I have both argued that that's a positive way to do that and I, and I think the other issue we're um, grappling with in New South Wales is how to deal with offsets if you want a net zero emissions target how do you deal with offsets if you're building something or or having to um, safeguard that elsewhere and um, we have a bit of a challenge in that a lot of our major projects are being built in, in, the, in Sydney um, and yet the offsets are found in regional New South Wales and the regional people resent that a little bit. So I'm wondering if Theresa had a solution or a suggestion as to how the UK has dealt with that or if you deal with it in that way. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I think offsets are a difficult issue because they're in one sense a natural thing to do. It, it seems to be obvious to, to, to do offsets. Um, one of the dangers is that actually they, uh, you do, an, do something immediately um, but it isn't followed through. So if I can just explain that often, you know, the, the thing with offsets, if you're taking a plane trip, for example, is plant some trees somewhere. Um, uh, the question is not just how many trees have you planted, but how many trees are still alive and um, contributing to the environment, uh, you know, four or five ten years down the, down the line. We haven't seen the sort of issues that you've identified, Gladys, in terms of a difference between where projects are being developed and, and where offsets are um, in, the, uh, in the UK. So we haven't had to face that particular challenge. But I think the, the, the challenge about offsets that we have faced is a lot of people saying that this is just an easy box way to deal with things. Um, and as I say, that actually there isn't a follow through to make sure that those offsets are continuing, really doing the, uh, the job that they were intended to do. Mm. Interesting. And like in Australia, I feel like we also lack, um, we don't have targets, as I mentioned, but we also lack in economic incentives or pools and, and um, to encourage large scale adoption of low emissions technologies. Uh, we don't have pushes either. We don't create target dates, for example, for phasing out older technologies. So when it comes to the stimulus measures, um, I mean, is the UK more for the pools or the pushes? Do they support more giving tax credits for those who are doing the right thing or subsidies or grants to accelerate certain you know, technologies like EVs or, or renewables? Or they prefer the 
carbon tax, which is something that we're quite against here in Australia. Yes, we've, we've done quite a lot on the, on the pools, on the encouragement side. So for example, on um, wind technology as a renewable, um, there was a, a, a huge effort put into providing subsidies for the development of wind technology. And that's an area, it's, it's a very good example where you can have a future economic benefit because some of the work being done in the UK on wind technologies, the developments of that um, have been uh, world leading and can then lead to you know, a, a business, an, an economic area, a new economic area that, that is a benefit in jobs here, but also can spread more widely as well. So I think those sorts of encouragements in people an incentive to do the right thing is uh, important. Of course, sometimes you need the, um, the, uh, the stick as well as the carrot. Um, and uh, in, in a good example, one of the issues around plastic, you know, charging people for plastic bags when they're using the uh, in supermarkets and shops um, seems a very small thing, but here in the UK has had a huge impact and we're increasing the, uh, the charge for plastic bags now. Um, so it's, a mi it's always got to be a mixture, it seems to me. Uh, I think there's a, one of the troubles in politics today is people are absolutists. They say, you know, either you've got to do all of this or you've got to do all of that. It goes back to what I said earlier about those people who said either you can have climate change being dealt with or you can have economic growth. Now, all of these things, there's always a balance between these different, uh, these different approaches. Um, so I think the incentives are good. The incentives do work, particularly in encouraging people to look for the new technologies, develop new technologies and adopt those new technologies. Yeah, I like that you mentioned the re reducing waste. And those are things that, um, you know, when we think about climate change, it's, you know, we leave the ideology to the side and then it's much more tangible for families and for people to think that, you know, we don't want a, a world full of plastic bags or we want to breathe better air, so we want less pollution. So those are things that I think the government should capitalize on COVID because we are breathing better air quality now and we want that to continue. So what are the programs or the stimulus or things that we can include to do that, whether it's reducing pollution by cars or having more public transport that is, um, you know, run by um, electric, it's electrically run and so on. So those are things that are much easier, I think, isn't it, Gladys, to convince the, the government to do rather than getting to a climate change discussion on reduce, reducing uh, emissions. There are, I guess one of the disadvantages during COVID has been more people are driving. We were getting great public transport take up, but because of the risk, we're seeing people go back to cars. And I hope that's a temporary thing. But I think one thing COVID has taught us is nobody wants peak hour traffic and nobody wants to waste time congested. And I think um, the more opportunities we offer to um, balance out the peak through all, day, all times of the day, um, a lot of initiatives we can do um, as, a, as governments to encourage our citizens to take up the low emission options is, is a healthier lifestyle. It's better for the environment and better for the economy. And we're more productive because we're wasting less time sitting in traffic. So I think, uh, again, um, I think the post-COVID world has a lot of opportunities for us to consider more sustainable ways of living, more sustainable ways of working and more sustainable ways of going about our business. And um, and I'm sure if I said this publicly, um, I don't think there's any media on this webinar, but, um, you know, the assessments we've done is the, the targets for net zero by 2050, it doesn't take much to get there. Um, it's, 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 um, you don't really need to do much to get to that position. Um, it's sufficiently ambitious, but it's not where we might actually end up, given how quickly the world's changing and how technology is replacing a lot of things and how digitisation is changing the way we do things. And... Um, I'm the eternal optimist and I think market-led solutions around jobs growth will expedite the renewable energy sector. And, um, but although there's, there seems to be you know, still demand from large economies for, for those other type of um, natural resources. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling more optimistic than not about, um, about the economic benefits of a more sustainable um, policy setting. Yeah. And so, Teresa, just, just more on, on how you managed to 
get consensus last year when you decided to commit to that net zero target uh, by 2050. How easy was it to get consensus within your party for that and from the opposition? Well, actually, um, the, the, there wasn't really any great pushback on that, uh, on that target. And, but I think this being, if you like, it's, it's an issue that has been developing through time. If I look at, at the sort of history of the politics of climate change here in the UK, in fact, um, one of the first leaders, uh, world leaders, to talk about this issue and about the importance of the environment was actually Margaret Thatcher, way back, um, which tends to be forgotten. But then the issue of the environment and climate change tended to be left to the left, uh, centre-left parties, and they sort of ran with it. And really here in the UK, it was David Cameron, who um, was entering a different sort of Conservative Party when he took over as leader, and recognised as one of the issues that we needed to give more attention to. Um, and so we've, been, we've now got if you like, win Parliament, far more parliament, Conservative parliamentarians who've been involved over the last few years in developing that thinking of, um, you know, that, that the Conservative Party is a party for the environment and the party for dealing with, this, with these issues. And as I say, said right at the beginning, and uh, as Gladys um, has said, I think it is so important that as centre-right petitions, we show that there is a way forward to deal with this issue which um, is not about rubbishing the economy, which has always been the argument in the past. I always say here in the UK, the Conservative Party is the party that's got conserve in its name. Um, mm. And therefore, we should be naturally thinking about our environment. And, uh, you know, as, as, as centre-right politicians, as Conservatives, we also believe in something for leaving something for the next generation. And climate change is about ensuring that the planet is there for the next generation and generations to come. So I think these fit very naturally into our thinking as conservatives. Hmm. Well, was, was there a similar motivation to you, Gladys, when you decided to set that net zero for New South Wales? Yes, I net? can't take the credit for that. My predecessor, Mike Beard, actually set that target, which I happily adopted and, and have run with. And I have a very enthusiastic... Um, environment and energy minister and we purposely put environment and energy together as portfolios to show that they're mutually inclusive not exclusive um, one goes with the other and um, and and we've had some great opportunities to pursue um, some some progressive policies um, that we hadn't before so um, again I'm optimistic about that but um, uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm also feeling that COVID presents that opportunity I think even at a, from a conservative perspective, if I can use that, um, conservative people um, not only value economic benefits of sustainable policy, but look at all of us in the way in which we now appreciate open, public open space and what significance that now has and being able to enjoy that space and the local public space. And we actually now have given our Minister for Planning additional responsibilities as also the Minister for Public Spaces because I think it's an opportunity to look at land that's surplus to government needs. And traditionally, you'd try and recoup an investment on that by building a, a, a tall building or selling it. Why not? You know, is there more human capital or human value in actually converting that to open space? And what public benefit does that have? Not in all circumstances, but certainly um, I think COVID has put that extra perspective on things as well, coupled with air quality and, and other things. So, you know, call me idealistic or overly optimistic, but I am sensing that, um, during the COVID recovery, there'll be a greater emphasis on, um, on these issues and also less fear about disruption. We've been so disrupted. We've, we've all been part of a science fiction movie for the last, you know, eight or nine months. And we all knew disruption was ongoing in the digital age, but it's been on steroids the last few months and we've all managed to adapt and some better than others. And I think we fear disruption less. So I think people will fear new technology less and see the benefits of it. Um, as well as the potential challenges. And the bottom line is what is best for the hip pocket? If you look at energy sources and what's going to give us um, going to reduce cost of living pressures as well as be sustainable, um, again, that's another argument for, for pursuing these progressive policies. Do you feel like having dealt with the bushfires and you know, that, that whole catastrophic and difficult situations that you had to go through have helped you at all with COVID or they were completely different? 
No, definitely. In fact, um, the experience with the bushfires taught me one important lesson is that when you have a catastrophic event that, it, that affects a large part of your state, you have to have a whole of government approach. You can't just have one agency looking after it. So from day one, we actually put police in charge of the logistics around the pandemic. So it allows our health experts to do contact tracing and whatever else. So I think the, the man, kind of having um, a lead agency in Commissioner Fitzsimmons with the Rural Fire Service, but then having every other state government agency form part of that decision-making and response was a wonderful learning for me to bring to the COVID experience. Um, but also, it's really interesting. I saw the huge disparity of views. I'd go to some communities where people's houses had burnt down. And the first thing they'd say to me is, what are you doing about climate change? And I'm thinking, your house has just burnt down. But that was how passionately people felt about it, felt about the issue. And then others are saying, well, let me rebuild and I don't care about the environment. And so even for very distraught, devastated communities, there is such a difference in view about how to approach these issues. And so it's a very delicate balance in, in the rebuilding process. But certainly the experience has taught me that I think um, the importance of having a whole of government approach to um, catastrophic events, but also a whole of government approach if you really want to implement change. It can't be just one solo part of government. It has to be whole of government. And, and one thing your predecessor did, I think, um, Teresa, was having, um, which we pinched, was the Prime Minister's priorities. We, we have the Premier's priorities, which my predecessor pinched. I think David Cameron introduced that to the UK. Did, um, and, and, and we've used that and tried to make sustainability and, um, uh, and other issues now whole of government rather than just the silo of one agency. I think that's, if I just pick up what Gladys was saying there, I think that is so important on an issue like climate change. Everybody has to be bought in to what, the, what role they can play in delivering on this and not just see it as a something that's for the environment department or the department with energy in it and everybody has their role to play i mean one of the one of the things that has um helped if you like to drive an interest in this in the uk is a huge take up interest from young people um you know i go into schools in my constituency and youngsters are really actively taking just small steps, but day-to-day -day steps to try to improve their environment and, and deal with these issues like plastic waste and, uh, and energy, um, uh, being much more careful about energy usage. And that's where I think, in a sense, the past, the climate change debate came too much about a big issue that, that for most people seemed to be something up there that they didn't, there was an argument about the scientists and so forth. Actually dealing with climate change is as much about the small steps everybody can make day to day to contribute to dealing with emissions um, as it is about the big changes that government bring about. And what Gladys said earlier about the, the sort of community spirit and the changed approach that seems to be coming out of, as a result of COVID, people's um, appreciation of issues like air quality, their natural surroundings, perhaps slightly more than in the past, will help to contribute to that ground up way of dealing with climate change, which has to, to, to mix with the government incentives and, and the sort of top down approach. So, so in talking about effects of climate change, as we're talking, Teresa, you've always been calling and I've been following you, you've been calling on other countries to raise their ambition uh, when it comes to emissions reductions, and we're not talking internationally, saying that there's a clear moral imperative um, for developed economies like Australia and the UK, for example, to help those around the world that stand to lose most from climate change, cons consequences of climate change, like say Bangladesh or the Pacific Islands. Um, so and in fact, I know that the UK International Environmental Minister, Lord Goldsmith has been stressing uh, the issue of helping Bangladesh to tackle climate change. But what's your advice then, for example, for Australian conservatives when it comes to raising our ambitions to support those most affected countries? Well, I think my, I mean, my advice is, uh, let me see, the, I mean, the first thing is this is an issue that matters. It matters for all our futures and it's something that conservatives should be addressing and dealing with. Um, and conservatives shouldn't be 
um, sort of frightened of dealing with it and seeing it just as a political issue for the left. This is something we need to embrace and develop our own approach to, which is what we've been doing and Gladys has been talking about what she has been doing in, in New South Wales. Um, I think but we have to accept our responsibility for other parts of the world as well. And that's certainly what the UK has done through our international development um, work and uh, helping to and providing in a variety of ways, both resource in terms of uh, some of the funding issues, um, but also expertise to help other, other parts of the world to actually be able to deal with this, deal with this as well. I think it's, there is, uh, as you say, Christina, there's a moral imperative there, but actually it's in everybody's interests to do this. If we're going to deal with climate change, if we're going to protect our planet for the future, it's no good just one or two countries doing something about it. We all need to, we need to ensure this is happening across the world. And of course, at the moment, one of the big concerns is the approach that the United States has taken to the whole climate change issue, you know, pulling out of the Paris um, climate change agreement. Uh, the, a lot of the states in the United States are taking action here but it would be good to see the US back in that agreement and back with the rest of us in terms of dealing with this issue. Mm. Yeah, of course. Well, look, let's talk then about, um, just to change the subject a little bit, since we're all females here today, but let's, let's talk about the role of women in climate and environment, because I think it's a very important role that we have in the conservation of natural resources. Um, Gladys, do you feel that there is a role for women in helping to achieve sustainability through politics. I mean, you're obviously um, one of the leaders there, but um, do you think we, we need to actually improve um, female representation to be able to have more females in the areas of conservation? Oh, I'm always um, buoyed by the number of women I meet in our various agencies that are leading the way in New South Wales by their expertise, whether it's through the sciences or through on the ground management of our national parks or um, in our energy sector. I think um, some of the leading regulators in the energy sector are, are, are amazing women and some of the experts the government relies on are, are amazing women. And I think women are playing a very strong and important part, but even at a household level, um, most women, as we know, run the household. And I think opportunities to have um, women empowered by um, encouraging sustainability in their own household is also a positive thing. I don't see it specifically as a, as a gender issue, to be honest. I think women are playing a really important part in all manner of, um, in all manner of um, sustainable policy and energy delivery for that matter. And that will continue. But I, I, it was interesting to me that air quality was a big issue during the bushfires in New South Wales. And we had, um, you know, smoke levels which, which had been unprecedented in, in New South Wales. And I would have to say about 90% or 80 to 90% of the correspondence I received with concerns about air quality was from women who worried about their asthmatic children or worried about their parents. I mean, it was interesting that whilst there was a general concern in the community, it was far more women that contacted the government about their, their concerns on air quality. And I don't know how to read into that. But certainly, um, it was a very but much more sensitive issue for women than men. And I, again, I can't read anything into that apart from just making that observation. But um, but generally speaking, I think women are very well represented. And um, and what um, Theresa May did during her time in office um, is, as, as as I said at the beginning, is legacy making. And to have a conservative Tory government uh, legislate 2050 emissions is the stuff of dreams in Australia. <laughs> and um, and uh, we can only help to emulate it. In fact, I know Minister Keane, my energy and environment minister's on the line. And, and Matt, we should, in addition to the MOU we've got with the feds, we should just say we're adopting um, the UK Tory strategy. That will go down well. Yeah. I'm just welcoming Matt now. He's just okay, texting awesome. me. We can't hear him, though. I think we have to make Oh, that's OK. He says, yeah. enough always. he says enough anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> I was going to make this a strictly women um, okay, webinar. <laughs> Not that I have anything against the man at all, but, but Teresa, you, you have criticized before the absence of women in company boardrooms, because as we know, there's still a little bit of a gender inequality happening in, in a business level. I think they're catching up a little bit more now, but especially in politics. 
Um, have you seen any positive changes uh, in the last couple of years or you know, decades, let's talk about decades when it comes to women, but have you seen any changes at corporate level or political level uh, that have improved female representation? Well, we have, we've, we've certainly seen moves forward in the UK in both the business community and in, in politics. In business, we are seeing um, more women on company boards, but there's a, there's a challenge because a number of those will be non-executive directors. And the real challenge is women being brought through the corporate pipeline um, you know, as directors and, and actually um, directors with an, uh, an operational responsibility within uh, companies, executive directors. So there's still a challenge there to, to be dealt with. And um, in politics, we've made huge strides. You know, I've been involved in that in the past in, in the Conservative Party. We've got far more women MPs now than we, we have had before. But we still need to keep, um, keep the foot on the accelerator and make sure that in, every, in everything that we do, one of the big things we did in the Conservative Party was look at our selection process for candidates to see if there was any inadvertent bias. Uh, and there was, I mean, the way it was run, it tended to favor the, um, how can I put it, more aggressively political males, rather than perhaps the, the women who could contribute equally, but in a different way. And I think this is one of the, the challenges always set in politics and business, is that women may do a job in a different way from a man, but it doesn't mean they're not going to get the good outcome that a man will get is just they may approach it slightly more differently. So in leadership, women are more likely to be more um, collegiate in their approach and bringing, wanting to bring their team with them. Um, whereas a man might be much more, um, you know, this is, this, is what, uh, this is what I say should happen and therefore go off and, and do it. There's whole different approaches, but it, but it doesn't mean because it's a different approach, it doesn't mean you get a worse result. You don't. Often you get better results. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's just accepting that women and men sometimes approach things in a slightly different, slightly different way. Mm. That's why it's good to have 50 50, isn't it? You get different points of views and email input. Well, you, you yes, it, it's, um, I, think, I think if you have a group of people make key decisions, such as in politics, all of whom have got the same sort of background, you will not get as good decisions as if you have a yeah. group of people with diverse backgrounds, diverse experience, um, you'll just get better decisions with that more, more diverse group. Yeah, yeah, I loved a study the Harvard Business School did during the G GFC. So forget all the values about gender equality, but the boards that had good female representation actually weathered the GFC better because men were very bullish in their decisions and women had a different perspective. So whether we like it or not, there is a general, you know, there's obviously a spectrum, but um, th there was a, a difference um, in approach and response to companies that have had a more balanced board. So forget all the values about why that should occur. Just look at the balance sheet result and <laughs> that should stir more people to, to fight for gender, gender balance. Yeah. Mm. Well, I would like to give everyone a chance to ask questions. So I'll, I'll open it before, but actually before I open it to all our guests, I just want to ask a more personal question to both Gladys and Teresa. I'll start with Gladys, but Gladys, um, since the end of last year, obviously, we've been waking up daily to make huge decisions that affect people's lives and livelihoods. Do, do you have a mechanism or a certain process to be able to get through the day, keeping yourself always so focused and motivated? I think um, the responsibility of the pandemic or the bushfires kind of sharpens your focus automatically. And... Um, all of us have had to adjust to massive change during this year and um, leaders as well as or as citizens first and foremost because we've lived with the fear of the virus and what it means to our own families and our circumstances. We've seen extended family members worry about their jobs and what that disruption means. And so I think um, what I've learned most um, in the last little while is, is to humanise the decision making and um, and at the end of the day, I care much less about what the commentariat say. I couldn't care less about what the so-called commentariat have to say. Um, if the health experts recommend a change in course or there's a logistical issue we need to deal with, which is different what we dealt with the previous month, they'll call it a backflip. I call it good decision making. So I, I guess you get more courageous when it's life and death matters, when it's trying to boost the economy. 
And uh, what motivates me is trying to get enough sleep and keep myself healthy so that I am clear minded when we're making these decisions. But I also think in a pandemic consensus is important when you're making really big decisions to try and bring as many of your colleagues, you'll never get 100% agreement. But I think, um, I think it's really important not to be stubborn and pick headed during a pandemic, but to be responsive and collegiate and bringing people together. So that's probably how I've maintained my focus and discipline. It's worked very well, by the way. And, and Teresa, you've also encountered, I'd say, a fair amount of pressure and adversity during your leadership. And um, just wanted to know how, how you dealt with those pressures in such a, an honorable, a respectful manner, uh, focusing on the end goal. Well, of course, the, the, the pressures I was dealing with were quite different from the pandemic. And I haven't had to... Um, deal and unlike this I haven't had to deal on a day-to-day -day basis with the decisions necessary for the pandemic but during my premiership I, I focus on the end goal and um, focus on what it is that you are trying to achieve and, and there will be knocks on the way and there'll be lots of criticism um, and, uh, and still is uh, but actually if you believe what you're doing is the right thing to do then I think that's what helps to support you and, uh, and take you through and just keeping that focus on what you believe is, is the right thing. Thank you. Um, I will start the Q&A so that we have more time for more questions. And um, I'll start with a question from the Honorable Mark Speakman, who's on the line. And he's asking Teresa, given China accounts for around 30% of global carbon emissions and it's growing, its future action will be critical to reducing global emissions. And given its increasingly um, challenging behavior on the world stage, how can we get results on the carbon emissions reduction? Well, it's obviously it's important that um, a country like China is taking its action in terms of, uh, in terms of emissions. I mean, there has been some evidence in the past of China actually taking some steps in this, uh, in this way. I have to say, I think that the, if you like, the uh, growing absolutist approach in international relations at the moment will not help to bring China into, uh, into dealing with this uh, climate change issue. I guess it's going to be one of the challenges for the UK leadership for COP26 next year is going to be to ensure that we have um, commitments from China as, and there is other, obviously, states around the world in relation to, to climate change. Um, I could go, I mean, there's a lot of issues around the relationships with China at the moment, not just, as, as you will know, Mark, not just about the, uh, the, the question of climate change. So I don't think you can look at it in um, just in silo as just one issue. It's going to be bound up with the whole question of overall relations with China. Um, and I, I've always said that the you know, the, the best hope for, for all of us is to be able to bring China into um, uh, a rules-based international order uh, that we're all comfortable with and that we can all operate within. And that will be the same climate change as it is for issues like trade and, and other issues. But of course, in um, the last, I guess, well, certainly six months to a year, that has become more challenging as we've seen the, much more of this sort of standoff in relation to China and other parts and, and the West on so many issues. But I still think maybe I'm, I've gone to Gladys's optimism on this issue that we can work and try to ensure that we can find a way of bringing China into that, into a rules-based international law on this issue as on others, um, that is going to be actually a benefit to them as well as a benefit to the rest of us. Thanks, Teresa. Do you want to comment, Gladys? Oh, um, just to say that I completely support um, support those those comments. And I guess um, for, for nations like the UK and Australia, we have the luxury of um, being able to put forward um, sustainable and progressive environment issues. But we have to appreciate that other nations have either challenges or, or philosophical obstacles to that. And I'd rather work with them in a constructive way than um, because we are so connected than, um, than not. And... Um, and incidentally, Teresa, the person that asked you that question is the outstanding Attorney General in New South Wales, who our, our chief lawmaker, but he's also a passionate advocate for the environment and he's too modest probably to say who he was. But um, And I should have mentioned 
<laughs> that was the question from him. It's good to know that we've got key cabinet members who are as passionate about the environment as, as you and I are, in fact, more so. Hmm. In, indeed, very good, very good. Excellent to hear. Right, is, I have a question for you from Jack Goff. Do you see a role for environmental restoration as part of post-COVID economic recovery, for example, by taking people in regional areas who have no jobs at the moment and redeploying them into temporary roles, undertaking work just uh, such as planting trees, repairing rivers and farming? Oh, look, we have an ambitious target of planting um, 5 million trees over the next two decades. Um, but in terms of um, jobs, it's very interesting. Regional New South Wales, for the first time in three or four years, has less than half the state in intense drought. So we're actually seeing um, a record harvest about to come in regional New South Wales. And in fact, we have um, a demand for labour in regional New South Wales, which is interesting. We actually need more workers in some of these agricultural pursuits, and uh, which is a, a topical conversation at the moment. But um, I do feel there are opportunities to grow industries and grow sectors through government policy and encouragement, um, which um, do create more jobs in those, um, in those areas. Um, but it's interesting to see that the, the biggest hits we're experiencing with unemployment at the moment are actually in our largest cities, not the regions. And, um, but, but I think um, our aim should be multifaceted. We should just create jobs where we can. And I think the market is responding to um, renewable energy sources and households will respond. If they, if they have opportunities to reduce their bills and feel good about what they're doing, they'll take that opportunity. And I think the market's responding sometimes more quickly than government is. And, um, and I think it's government and the private sector working together, which can uh, create those opportunities. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, a question for both of you from Ben Krasenstein. What, what are the things that the investor community can do to provide space and support for conserv conservative politicians when it comes to speaking up on the transition we all face? Sorry, Christiana, I missed the first part of your question. I guess he's asking what, um, what things the investors can do to provide space and support for conservative politicians when it comes to speaking up on the transition we all face. I think um, just, I think to Teresa's point earlier, um, there shouldn't be an assumption that only left of centre politicians care about these issues, that Centre, centre right politicians not only care about these issues, but see the economic prosperity that this brings. And I think there's a happy place where we can form important alliances and, um, and work to those means. But I think Theresa would be the best place to answer that question. Well, I, I, I think something which is very simple, which is just about investors and business generally um, showing their own interest in this issue and talking about the economic benefits of dealing with it. Um, and so that there's, there's what Gladys has just talked about, the, the sort of working together between the politicians and business to, uh, to show that there is a way forward that bring economic prosperity and, and um, reduce, uh, reduce emissions. Um, obviously, there are investors who will look carefully at the sort of company they're investing in at their environmental policies. Here in the UK, you see a lot more in, now in company reports and accounts on sustainability, this whole concept of, um, of uh, what used to be social responsibility, now ESG for companies, looking at, at what they're doing in a whole number of, of uh, areas, including environment and sustainability, is putting much more of a focus on the work of individual businesses. But I think it's for in investors to show that actually uh, that it is important to them that companies are taking this seriously and dealing with um, and that will get a message through to the companies. And then we can all give that clear message that economic growth is possible alongside dealing with emissions, dealing with climate mm. change. Mm. Very good. There's a question from James Cullimore from SEN in, in the UK. He's asking both of you, uh, what do you think are the priorities for a green recovery ahead of COP26? And how can... Um, how can conservatives in the UK and Australia work together to drive ambitious climate action? You want to start, Teresa? 
Well, I mean, just the, the last part of James's, uh, what James has said, I think the, the work that uh, Christina, your group in Australia is doing with SEN, the fact that we've now have had David, Cameron, and, and I think Malcolm doing um, a webinar on this, there's myself and, and, uh, and Gladys, um, I think it's showing that a number of ways in which we can learn, be talking about issues together and learning from each other. Uh, and I think that maintaining those links is, uh, is incredibly important. I think as we, as we look to the um, developments for the future, looking to the government to put even more emphasis perhaps on some of those aspects of uh, government policy that will help in the area of reducing emissions. So um, the, the, the necessity, for example, here in the UK for us to see uh, a, a, that rollout of charging points for electric vehicles. Um, there's going to come a point, we're not there yet, where the market on electric vehicles is such that actually more people can afford them. At the moment, they, you know, they, they do cost a lot of money to buy an electric vehicle here in the UK. Um, but government can help by, showing, by encouraging um, not only the development of electric vehicles, but also making sure that the infrastructure is there in place for their, uh, for their usage. If I may, just one concern I have about the impact of COVID, which is we were moving... Um, to a much more um, sort of sustainable issue on, on the small scale everyday issues like reusable cups and you know things like that when you went to the coffee shop and you got a takeaway. Um, I went to have a, a, a coffee the other day in, in somewhere that my husband and I often go to on a Saturday morning where we would sit in and have our coffee in China uh, we went into the dishwasher. Now they you have a throwaway cup to, uh, because of COVID. I'm not sure where the science is between those two, I have to say, um, but there are some areas where we're seeing actually more um, plastic, more um, things like the um, throwaway cups and things like that being used as a result of COVID, just at the point where we were actually moving away from these, part of that wider issue about reducing waste and, uh, and dealing with the environment. So we just have to watch out for that. Mm. Yeah. As a germaphobe, I can relate to that, Teresa, but we have to be more stunning. Yeah. And Teresa, Georgia Wright is asking, um, not related to climate change now, but how, how is the UK mental health services coping, noting that when you were at Downing Street, you delivered the largest expansion of mental health in a generation? She's just um, referring to COVID. Mm. Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and um, there's more resource going into mental health services here in the UK, but we've got, uh, even before COVID, we had a lot of catching up to do because mental health had not been given the attention that it needed to be uh, within the health service or more generally. I fear that we are going to see more mental health problems emerging in the future as a result of, of COVID. Um, there will be those, there are a number of issues that COVID will have exacerbated. Mental health is one of those. Uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse is another. Um, when people are in that lockdown situation, in an isolated situation, there are mental health impacts. I think we have to be very careful about issues around children who have been off school for some time, some of whom will yeah. have fallen behind. Their, their mental health as they go back into school and there's that catch up or, or for them who may not feel able to catch up, be able to catch up, the mental health aspect of that, I think are going to be very important for us to watch out for and to be able to deal with in the future. So there are, the focus on COVID is always on people who have the virus and how they survive. We know there are some long-term impacts appear to be coming through from people who've had the virus as well. Um, but the, we also need to remember those others who perhaps haven't had the virus, but for whom the, um, the way of dealing with the virus will have an impact and potentially a negative impact and mental health is one of those areas. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the New South Wales government has put a lot of effort into the mental health side, isn't it, Gladys, since the bushfires as well? No, we have, but um, to Teresa's point, how do you deal with sustained trauma? I mean, it's difficult enough for adults to get our heads around the COVID situation, but how children and teenagers are coping is beyond me. Um, and whether that will have medium to longer term impacts is, is yet to be determined. And I think it's just important for us 
now more than ever to talk about our mental health as well as our physical health. Um, a broken arm is no different to depression and reducing the stigma during this time. I think COVID has, you know, humanised all of us and and um, created enormous empathy. And um, and I think we have to be more conscious about um, the mental health needs of the community and how not just direct investment in mental health, but other things like jobs and providing meaningful work and providing a good access to services actually enhances people's ability to cope and, and, and be resilient. And again, it's a whole of government approach. And um, I never feel we do enough in mental health, no matter what resources we put in. We, I don't think anywhere on the planet has quite got a grip on how best to put resources because you do need to put acute services on its head and, 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 and kind of rearrange things. And um, that's a bigger conversation. But I do feel that um, COVID exacerbates underlying conditions, but it also creates greater anxiety about separation and loneliness and um, also disconnectedness. And um, I remember what an ambitious young thing I was when I was leaving uni and looking for work, but I worry about this generation not getting their foot in that career ladder and what that means for them. Um, but also for those uh, who've been dislocated from their occupations. And I think every part of society is going through enormous change. And not only, I think, should we focus more on the mental health of our population, but also how we value human life. I think it shed light on how we treat our elderly and how we need to do better, frankly. And, um, and I think the post-COVID world, again, I'm the eternal optimist and idealist, will be more kinder and generous and tolerant um, than what we've been. And that's certainly my hope. And governments can lead by example by putting in good policy settings. But at the end of the day, that comes from community more than government. Agree. Thanks, Gladys. Teresa, we were chatting before about the um, climate demonstrations that will start soon in, in London or in the UK. We've got a question here from our Youth for Conservation Chair, Riley Taylor. What kind of policy responses could the governments put forward to address that feeling of apathy that the youth experiences to, due to this perceived inaction on climate change? Well, I think the very sim one of the very simple things for government to do, actually, is just be talking about how much they are doing in, in terms of climate change. I mean, obviously, what is happening for those, the, the demonstrators, the, the, um, the argument is it's not enough. Um, well, I sometimes think, well, the UK has put 2050 into, um, into our legislation, but it, it isn't. It's what I was saying earlier. For those who think that there's an instant solution to it, that there's one step government take or even a small combination of steps a government can take now that's going to immediately bring about all of this change. This is about government working with business, working with people. It's about people making changes day to day and being encouraged to make those changes. And where I have a problem with some of the um, climate arguments in the past has been an expectation that you tell people to completely disrupt their lives, to completely overturn their lives. Now, Gladys said earlier, COVID means we're more used to, we've, we've just had a huge disruption and maybe we'll embrace disruption more in, in the future. But I think people will want, still want to have some sense of um, being back into a life that they recognise as something mm. bad pre-COVID. Saying to people suddenly, you know, you've got to change everything. You can't drive anywhere. You can't fly anywhere. You can't do this. You can't do that. Is not the approach to take with climate change. We have to yeah. bring people along with us. We have to build on that, as, as Gladys was saying earlier, that sense coming out of COVID of a greater sense of community and the, that concept of the importance of sustainability and help people to make small changes day to day and government to make those, um, you know, take key issues like the encouragement of electric vehicles and together we'll deal with this. But it's going to be, it's a path to an end rather than something that's going to happen immediately. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that too. Um, so another question here, which is a bit more controversial, has got to do with nuclear. The UK has a significant proportion of reliable zero emissions nuclear power, uh, Theresa. Do you see nuclear as a very acceptable renewable option? And also for Gladys, is that going to be ever in, in, in the agenda for New South Wales? Well, interestingly, we, we have... Uh, from the U Sorry, you go. No, carry on, Gladys. No, you go first. <laughs> we, um, for, for the UK, we have uh, 
I think we see nuclear as a part of our energy mix. Um, but the problem is that for 25 years, uh, nothing really was done to renew our nuclear capacity. Um, so one of the decisions I took when I came into the Premiership was to um, go ahead with the development of Hinkley Point C and uh, as a new nuclear um, reactor and new nuclear power facility here in the UK. And we were looking to see if it was possible to develop other nuclear uh, uh, capacity as well. The problem is the huge cost of developing nuclear uh, and uh, ensuring that what's going to come out of it is a cost of the power that is going to be uh, reasonable for those who are, who are consuming it and paying for it. And that has been the great, uh, the great challenge. I think it's a great sadness that over the last couple of decades or so, Conservative governments have not taken decisions to in, uh, ensure that investment place in, in nuclear, this is private sector investment, um, but uh, we are where we are. I think it's important that we, if we can, find a way of ensuring that we maintain, not just maintain, but actually um, perhaps increase the uh, percentage that is provided, of energy provided by nuclear. I think that's an important part of the mix. Well, in terms of Australia, um, at a national level, it's illegal to actually run a nuclear power station. So our federal laws don't allow that. But interestingly, we've had a debate from some of the crossbench in the New South Wales Parliament on whether we should allow uranium mining, um, which is unlikely to, um, to be passed in the short term. But it's interesting that we've been having that debate in New South Wales. But um, currently, it's illegal at a national level. Um, to do that. So interestingly also, um, obviously you've got a more mature market in the UK, but um, market indications here in Australia would be that it would be very costly and um, not provide the benefit for some time. So I'm not sure whether the market would even take up that opportunity if we did make it legal. Gladys, there's a question for you from Bruce Story. Uh, he's mentioning that in the UK, many initiatives have been undertaken to reduce vehicle emissions with a proposed ban of all petrol, diesel and hybrid vehicles by 2035. In Australia, we have the highest vehicle emissions per capita. In New South Wales, we are experiencing ever increasing vehicle emissions. Are there any changes planned um, to address this problem here? Well, definitely until COVID struck, we were doing quite well in transferring people from vehicle use to public transport and active transport. So riding, walking, catching modes of transport. Our metro system is getting up and running. Our light rail system's been extended in the CBD. So we did have some great shifts in, um, in mode from car to, to public transport. And also um, we have built a number of motorways, which yes, reduce travel time and congestion, but they are toll roaded. So people did have an incentive to catch public transport. Um, but unfortunately COVID's thrown a spanner in the works because obviously people feel safer in their individual cars rather than mass transit. Um, and, um, you know, we'd be more than happy to consider anything which encouraged greater use of, um, uh, of vehicles which reduced emissions, price points an issue where if it costs more to have a vehicle with, which emits uh, less emissions, um, there's less incentive for, for people to, I guess, partake. So, um, in essence, I, I would prefer a market-driven approach to that, um, coupled with good public transport policies and settings. And I know in London, you've got the congestion tax, which disincentivizes people from driving, Teresa, and um, that's not something we'd do here, but I think um, the availability and access of public transport mitigates against that. But um, Matt Keane, the Environment Minister who's on the, on the line, is far more um, advanced in his thinking on this, so I don't know if there's time for him to say anything, Christina, otherwise I'll leave it there. Mm. Uh, we, if he, is he, I have to find out if he's still there and I'll see if uh, we can put him on the line at the end. I'll just check how. Oh, no, that. I think he's left. Don't worry. Okay. Well, I think we've only got time now for one more question. It's already 7.36 and um, I will ask, there's a question from Chris Sanderson to Teresa. What is the UK doing so well to manage the transition from fossil fuels energy to renewables? Well, it's, it's um, a, the, in the UK, I'm pleased to say, uh, I'm not sure this will go down so well in Australia, but I'm pleased to say between mid, um, sort of early April and early June, we had our longest period of, uh, of non-coal usage in terms of the production of, uh, production of uh, power. Of course, 
we haven't been as um, dependent on coal some time now here in the uh, in the UK. Um, we've been we're moving away um, for some years to developing renewables. A lot of this is about, but if you look at that, the how you um, how you deal with this, and for those countries who still have, like Australia, still have significant coal, it's about being able to transition the areas where. Um, that the, the, um, the mining is important in terms of jobs and local economy, transitioning them into a different approach and a different um, type of uh, job. And uh, there'll be opportunities of, of various sorts, but the incentives that governments here in the UK have used for renewables has been an important part of, of this equation of um, ensuring that there was that interest in taking up the opportunities for renewable. I mean, there's, there's wind has been the key um, renewable here in the UK. Obviously, there are some countries, um, we've had some success with solar, but there are some countries where solar is a, is a more important um, uh, source rather than the uh, wind um, turbines that we've been uh, developing and, and leading on in, in the UK. Um, but it's, there's, there's an element of incentive to encourage people to move to these new areas, um, for businesses to see an opportunity in those new areas, and then develop that technology, develop those jobs, which can provide that transition. Thank you. Thank you. We were trying to get Matt in, but he's not in yet. So I will ask now, and thanks for your contribution, uh, Gladys and Teresa, to, to such an important topic here in Australia for us. What I'd like to do is invite Chris McDevon to do a little wrap up for us and a vote of thanks. And Chris is not only the ambassador for C4C, but she was also the first female president of the Liberal Party at federal level here in Australia and has been a great advocate uh, for the environment and for women. So I'd like to welcome Chris to say a few words before we, we finish. And incidentally, happy birthday to the party on Monday, 75 years. It is indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Gladys. We're getting wow, old. What, <laughs> we are indeed. What an excellent webinar. And first of all, Christina, thanks to you for the contribution that you've made. Uh, I've been watching some of the comments coming through in the chat, and it's very obvious that this has been a very, very successful um, discussion. Not one of us will deny that the world is under immense stress, whether it's environmentally, it's economically or politically, but the one issue that links them all is climate change and taking some action. A lot of speakers that we have on this topic actually do baffle us with science and or describe the problem at length, but don't offer solutions and hope. And tonight you both were way more optimistic and gave us a lot more hope. And I sincerely thank you for that. Theresa, I do hope that the new UK net zero 2050 policy, which contains some practical solutions, I might add, I hope that history does re record your part in that and it is definitely mm -hmm. part of your legacy. Yeah. And thank you very much for answering the question so openly and honestly, and definitely from your heart, so that we could learn more and we can consider other options down here in Australia. And Gladys, I add my personal congratulations to you on the way you're leading our state. I'm so proud of you. I've known you a very long time. And yes, yes, a very long time. But the way you're leading the state at the moment is exceptional. And we all sincerely thank you. But um, in regards to tonight's discussion, um, I agree with you that there are some positive changes coming out from COVID and perhaps some of the cultural shifts will help us consider the jobs of the future. But there are also more opportunities to consider the sustainable ways we can live our lives coming out of this very strange period of our lives. But both of you, thank you so much for demonstrating that this is an issue that conservatives can lead policy on and take significant action on. I, I just don't know why we can't seem to control the narrative better on our side of politics. Thank you both for your time this evening um, or this morning, Teresa. Thank you for your expertise and sharing your extensive knowledge 
much with us and thank you both for your ongoing leadership. And Christina, again, thank you for organizing this wonderful webinar. Thank you so much, Chris. And of course, Teresa, we're all feeling more invigorated after today. Thank you for participating and for the support you're giving us. Uh, we'd like to see you again at post COVID whenever the flights are there and hopefully in, in COP26 next year. But uh, I'd just like to thank Gladys again and on behalf of all New South Wales um, people for, for everything she's done for us during those two terrible crises that we have consecutively had to leave and still leaving. And I just want to announce that on the 29th of this month, uh, C4C is actually launching our Youth for Conservation Group. We believe that it's very important to get the young people to support and, and to have an active voice within what we're doing. So we're launching with Minister Matt Keane, and he couldn't join because we couldn't get him on, online, on the line now, but Minister Matt Keane will be with us on the 29th of September, launching Youth for Conservation. So if you haven't signed up, go to our website, sign up, and you will receive the invitation. Thanks again. Uh, I hope things go well in the UK, and here in Australia, we seem to be you know, under control, except for a couple of little things that I think we still have to do in Victoria, but hopefully things will get much better by the end of the year and we can all see our families at Christmas. So stay safe. I'd like to thank everyone who attended, including all our MPs and all the politicians who support C4C and SAN, because SAN uh, in the UK has been such an important party uh, in this conversation with us in Australia. So thank you very much, Sam Hall and everybody from, from SAN. So stay safe, everyone. Have a good night, and we'll see you again on the 29th. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Chris. Bye, Christina. Bye, Chris.